would to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I didn't really have an exact picked out title for this, but basically we were going to be talking about gifts. Spiritual gifts, natural talents, things that can be used for God and His purposes. So let's look at Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 4 through 9. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on ex exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Then verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is good. Cleave to that which is good. I like how he rhymes there. Actually, I mix those two sentences up. It doesn't actually rhyme. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. There we go. So, basically this is talking about something called spiritual gifts. Things that are given to Christians, things that are given to people by God, specifically designed to be used in his church, in the church body, in the foundation of believers. And there's a purpose he has that he wants you to fulfill with these spiritual gifts. But first we need to know what the spiritual gifts are and which ones we have in order to do so. Basically, we are members of one body. It said it in the beginning verses there. Uh, chapter 12, like 4 and 5 there. It talks about us being a part of the body of Christ. Basically, we are all members. That is where we get the word member of being a member of a church. We are a physical member as a hand would be to the body. We are a member of the church in Christ's body. Therefore, we all have a certain purpose to fulfill. We have something that we need to be doing in order to fulfill our purpose in the body. If we go throughout life without ever using our left hand, that left hand would not be fulfilling its purpose, and it would be causing the body to drag behind in what you're doing. You're carrying two by fours with one hand, and your left hand is not doing anything. Yeah. That is what we many Christians nowadays do. They sit in the church pews, and they've got these gifts, these talents, some natural talents, some spiritual gifts that go more toward the personality that God has given them, specifically designed to be used and those gifts are being set on the shelf, and they're gaining dust. So, we're going to look at a few of those gifts tonight. There's approximately seven gifts found in three portions of the Scripture in the New Testament where these gifts are mentioned, and you can make out about seven out of the different passages there. So let's see, we all have purposes and gifts to complete our purpose. God gives us a purpose in life. Many people find it hard to go on, find it hard to live. Lots of people have struggles, even people considering suicide in our world because they have no purpose. They don't see something worth living for. They don't see a person worth living for. They've tried time and time again. I've talked about this void that we have in our souls that God is meant to fit. And part of that piece there is our purpose to serve him. God specifically designed each of us to serve him. Many people, the devil likes to darken this in our minds, God, uh, the devil likes to put this in people's minds that we should be the center of our own universe. It's becoming more and more of a self-centered society with the entertainment, with the things you see, the things you do. It's all me, my, my self-centered things that the devil is trying to put in front of us. Now the problem with that is that is not what we're meant to be. This is why no matter how much entertainment, no matter how, mu how much fun, no matter how many people look at you and think you're awesome with all the YouTube videos, all the people that are great stars maybe in music or things, these people that are looked up to still are looking for more, still need something else and nothing really fills that void because they're looking at it in the wrong direction. We're not meant to be served, we're meant to be, we are meant to serve. And this is how God designed it and the devil through all his lies and deception, has made us feel like that's not true. And the world completely sees that as the opposite of what it should be. 
So first of all, we're going to look at a God-given capacity so, to serve the Lord. That is that is the definition of a spiritual gift. So let me read it again. A God-given capacity to serve the Lord. Something that God has given us a capability to fulfill our purpose. Uh, basically, you're not meant to walk on your hands. I've seen... Uh, actors do it, maybe acrobats and different things, but day to day life, God made us to walk on our feet. Our eyes see upright. Right now, you know how the picture flips and everything, and God made our eyes to see upright. So if you're upside down walking on your hands, everything would be upside down and it would be very hard to do things. Uh, your hands were not also not meant to, um, or for example, your feet weren't meant to pick up things. They do not have as long as uh, whatever these are called. I forgot the word. Digits. They don't have digits or phalanges to be able to pick up things properly. Whereas your toes are meant to be great. All these things were designed and put into us. And if you're not doing your purpose the way it's supposed to be, it just doesn't work out properly and something feels off. What is the purpose of a cup? The purpose is a, of a cup is to hold liquid. That is its purpose. And it feels literally fulfilled <laughs> when you fill it with liquid and it fulfills its purpose. The same for our Christian lives, the same for people today, is they're trying to fill themselves with all these things that they're not meant to do. They're trying to use the cup as a hammer, or they're trying to use the cup as a spoon. I've had to do this at work because I forget my utensils at home. You warm up in your food and you go, forgot a fork. Again. So you're taking a water bottle and you're taking your knife and you're cutting it and moving it in a certain way. It's a pain. <laughs> it's a pain to try to deal with. Or I've used I've used a pen that I found in my car as a fork to try to spoon it in. And it doesn't work properly. That is not what a cup or a pen is supposed to do. Therefore, it doesn't work properly. It's not meant for that purpose, just like we're not meant to please ourselves. Uh, spiritual gifts are given to Christians in order to serve in the church body. No one has all the gifts. So none of us will have all seven of these gifts that I get into. None of us will have all of those. But if you look closely at these seven gifts, you will definitely see one or more in your own life. And if you don't see, take a little bit deeper look maybe on these spiritual gifts in Scripture. And God will reveal these to you so you can start actually using them and practicing with them. No one has all the gifts. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, But all these worketh that one in the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally bleh, as he will. Basically, the church is kind of like a puzzle. Puzzle pieces fit together, and they're specifically designed. A very good puzzle... You will not be able to fit the pieces. Some of these cheaper puzzles, you go to fit in, you think, I think that works, and you kind of fit it in there. Or, as Ryan's doing, you just kind of smash it in. It's like, this is a pain, I don't know where the piece is. Or, has anyone gotten to the end of the puzzle, and there's one piece missing? So disheartening. And that's how many times the man of God feels. Many times the pastor sees people in the church... And God has given him the wisdom to see where you would fit perfectly. I can see your skills. I can see your love for this certain area. And when you don't step up and when you don't look for the things that God could be using you in, it's like that missing piece of the puzzle. If you would just look, if you would just listen to those around you, if you would just listen to God when he pushes on this thing, then the church would run so much more smoothly. The church would paint this great picture that it's supposed to. The church is also like the parts of an engine. All the parts of an engine are necessary in order to make that engine run. And all the cogs and whistles and things that I don't understand because I'm not a mechanic. <laughs> all these things that work together, and the cogs are supposed to mesh a certain way, I think, to make this car work right. And if you don't have those, it's not going to work right. Sensible stuff, but it helps us to picture how the church is supposed to work. Good. Basically, we all need each other. As Christians, we all need each other to lift each other up, to help push each other to be better, to help each other see even what our gifts are and how to use them. So let's look at these seven gifts here. Let's see what passage of scripture here. 
Oh, let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 25. Look here. So I'll read you a little bit. Uh, we'll look at a little bit of the context. I don't have time to read it. But some of the context here is Jesus is telling his disciples of the future. What is going to happen in the future? He talks about the, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. I actually looked at this. It's very interesting and very hard to understand. <laughs> but Daniel the prophet spoke about this antichrist coming, and Jesus gives a little bit of a timeline there and shows them different things and what to look for in these different things there. And he gets to the point where when Christ is coming, he's going to come as a thief in the night. Something that you completely don't see com coming, someone that comes out of nowhere and takes you completely by surprise. That is the idea here. In the blink of an eye, Christ is going to come when we least expect it. And what he admonishes the disciples to do is he says, live as if I'm coming at any moment. Be that watchman, is what he says in these scriptures here. And watch for me and do the things that you need to to prepare for me. And then right after that, he goes into the parable of the ten virgins in the beginning of chapter 25 and talks about the ten virgins and the five virgins did, didn't grab vessels of oil with their lamps and they burned out and they try to ask the other virgins <coughs> to give them some of their oil and they're like, no, go buy some of your own. And they miss, they miss the closing time for the gate there. And then it goes into the parable of the talents. So let's look here at verse 14. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Now, if you stop for a moment in verse 14, uh, who called his own servants. So this seems to be talking about God. The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants which would symbolize us as Christians and delivered unto them his goods so he gave them a portion of his goods to take care of verse 15 and unto one he gave five talents and to another two and to another one to every man according to his several ability if you recognize that we just talked about the second Corinthians how it, it lines up very similarly with 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but all these work as that one in the self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Uh, the rest of verse 15, and straightway took his journey. So he's leaving now, and he's left his servants in charge of these different portions of his goodness. Verse 16, then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained another two. But he that had received the one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. There was no, the servants saw him from afar off. No, it was, their Lord came back and he's there now reckoning with them. It was just a sudden pop in there. Verse 20. And so he that had received five talents and came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Verse 22. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Notice the exact same response by the Lord there. This guy had two. He gained two more. This guy had five, and he gained five more. This guy's obviously worth a little bit more money. He's gained five more talents, whatever that portion of money is. He's made the master more money. But yet the master takes both of them and he goes, gives them the exact same response. The exact same response there because they both went out and they both did what they could with what God had given them. So you may not be the most talented person. 
think of Miles Pike. He comes in with five octaves of range and doing all this stuff, trying to work for the Lord in his CDs and everything. You're like, I have like maybe half an octave. I can't hardly sing at all. But God gives everyone a little bit or a lot of it, depending on what he knows he can use in you. doesn't mean you can't use what he's given you, depending on how much it is. But he wants, he gives you this so that you can use it. And he gives everyone the option, this free will, to be able to use what he's given you for his purposes. And you've got to look for that and see it. Uh, let's see here, continuing on a little bit. Uh, verse 24, I believe. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And you see the world influencing this guy a lot. Yeah. Where you're trying to collect where you didn't sow. You're trying to make another talent. He ends up giving him his one talent back. See, you gave me this gift, and I'm giving it back to you. And God's like, I gave this to you so that you could use it whether you lost it, whether you earned just a little bit by through the changers, as, as he goes on to say, at least you would have done something with this gift that he's given you. But instead he gets this worldly mentality where he goes, almost, you're not willing to be served. Uh, I mean, you're not worthy to be served. You're not worth enough to be served with this. So I'll just give you back what you've given me, and we'll call it even. Where God specifically designed each of us with those talents to serve him with those. And actually, we'll look at a quote at the end of this where we are the most satisfied when he is most glorified. I'll look at the actual quote in a minute. But it's a really good quote that we are most satisfied when he is most glorified. When, when God is put high, we are lifted up with him in, in a sense there. So, as you go on there, you know the rest from the story, and he continues to go on, and he says, um, this kind of took me for a loop at the end here, he says, uh, in verse 30, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into, the, into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I looked at a portion of scripture different than this, and it seemed like Jesus was talking more like the, the goats and the sheep, I'm sure you're familiar with that passage, and it seems to talk more about heaven and hell in that sense in accepting Jesus or not accepting Jesus. But in this portion of scripture, we already looked at how Jesus is saying, or the, the master here gives his own servants the portion of his goods to go out and use. So this is obviously talking to Christians. So what does this end part mean? Basically what I believe the end part means is the weeping and gnashing of teeth part is I wish I had given him more. You know that song, I wish I had given him more. You're going to get to the judgment seat. You're going to get to heaven. And the reason there's tears in your eyes for Jesus to wipe away in Revelation right. is one of the reasons is because I didn't do what I could. Yeah. Right. There was so much I could have done for God, and I wasted it, and I squandered it, and I hid it in the earth just like this servant, putting that one talent in the earth instead of using it for him when I should have. I let the world influence me instead of doing like those two other faithful servants and earning that again. So, I wish I had given him more. That's a really good song to look up. I don't have time to go into the words. But wiping the tears away from our eyes, that's one of the reasons I believe is we wish we had given him more. All that regret that we have that we didn't do on from this earth. So let's get into the spiritual gifts. Look at a few of them, see if we can add a few of them to our lives here. So let's see. A description of spiritual gifts. Every child of God has one or more of these seven gifts. So the three main passages where you find these spiritual gifts listed is 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, and Romans 12. So those are the three portions of Scripture where you find these, and you can kind of break them down and look at them. And you get seven ones that join together here throughout those. So the first one is prophecy. So this is declaring God's truth for a response. Basically, it's putting, it's studying, getting this truth from God to give to the people in order for them to make a decision, in order for them to do something with it. It's not predicting the 
future, as we often think prophecy means you're prophesying of the future. But this is prophecy, or this is preaching. It's inspired preaching, preaching for people to respond, something to be done, either in salvation or a commitment, something you're doing with this truth. Basically, it's motivating people to respond to Jesus Christ. Every church needs this gift, especially in their pastors. A pastor, qualification of the pastor, I believe, is having this gift of prophecy, where he can take God's word and he can get that truth, and then he can present it so that the people can make a commitment, make a change, and continue to further themselves for Christ. The second year we're looking at the seventh, ministry. Seeing a need and meeting it. Basically, this is working, serving, decorating, all, the, all these different things where you can just serve, get in there, get your hands dirty, cleaning in the church, different things like that. Uh, work at a soup kitchen, clothes closet, rescue mission, change the oil in the car of a widow, ministering in the body of Christ. All these things that you do to kind of make these cogs work smoothly. This gift looks around and finds needs, but then does something about it. Sorry to disappoint you and, and myself many times in this, but there's no spiritual gift of complaining. Right. <laughs> or, or criticism. Complaining or criticism. You are, that is not a spiritual gift. That is something that we come across naturally. And if you need to differentiate this, it, it doesn't come out right when you speak on things. But basically the dif difference between a critic or a complainer and someone who has the gift of ministry and the spiritual gifts is the person goes a step further and does something about it. They recognize the need and then they yeah, do yeah. something about it. This gift does something to meet those needs that they see. Basically, then there's number three, teaching. Uh, basically, this is sharing God's truth that transforms. Well, so this is a little bit different than prophecy, a little bit different than prophesying. Teaching, teaching is basically the gift of preaching is intended for response, whereas the gift of teaching aims for transforming. It's almost a slow um, discipleship, if you will. Something where you're discipling this person, going on Bible studies with them, and desiring to share these truths that God, God gives to you without preaching to make an immediate decision. It's like a slow transformation process where you change your thinking and your behavior based on the Word of God through someone teaching you. A person may have a natural talent to teach, to inform people. So this can this can be a natural talent as well as a spiritual talent to inform people, to find things that you think are cool and inform people about those. And if you just want to share information with people, you would just want to teach people new, cool, different things. Uh, if you have this gift, basically what you need to do is start teaching the Word of God. Start finding people to be able to talk to, do Bible studies to, work things out through the Word of God and talk about it. Uh, fourthly here, we have the gift of exhortation. Motivating others by words and acts. This is the Barnabas of the church. These are the people that come in and they lift you up. They lift the pastor up. They lift the song leader up. They lift these people up. Not just to make them feel good and to make them keep like they uh, feel like they can keep going, but also to push them towards more godly acts. That's that's the goal of exhortation as well. Pushing people up, building them up towards Christ as well. Give uh, to give up a sinful habit, um, do something for God. This is the things where you exhort people. Uh, you might send cards, letters, maybe a phone call, an email, things like that you can do to try to exhort people. It's uh, kind of like spiritual cheerleading, if you will. <laughs> Think of cheerleaders in football games. Or try not to get a picture in your head of cheerleaders <laughs> in football games. Though. Nice. But, uh, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> but basically, cheerleaders are meant to be there to encourage the team. They're meant to stand on the sidelines and encourage the team and try to pump them up in Christ. And that's what we're supposed to do as Christians but especially the, I almost said extortioners, uh, the people with the gift of exhortation. There we go. Um, fifthly, we have giving. Uh, this is, so giving is one of the ones that is also a command. So God commands all of this of us to give cheerfully as Christians, but some people God specifically blesses with a giving heart. Either God bless them with a lot,
lots and lots of finances so that they can give and give and give in a supernatural way, or he helps them to live more humbly with less with less things to spend their money on and give more to Christ's work. That's what a giver does. Uh, basically, uh, sixthly here, we have ruling. Now, this is the perfect person, excuse me, who organizes uh, to complete God's work. Basically, this is the person who sits down and thinks about things, puts things together, plans events and different things to make God's work run in order like a clock would. This is the person that gets behind the desk and makes things run and plans things beforehand in order to help them to run properly. Yes. Seventh here, we have mercy. Seeing and helping hurting people. So this is uh, Romans 12, 8 says, He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So this is the person who sees someone struggling, and they can recognize it. Maybe they're a little bit more observant, and they can recognize this person is struggling. This person is hurting. This person needs a helping hand somehow. And, they need, and that person will then go in and try to help lift them up and encourage them and bring them back into the fold, if you will, to help them and give them that Christ-like mercy. By the way, all seven of them, I don't have time to get into it now, but all seven of them you can find in Jesus. Jesus is the only man who is given all seven spiritual gifts. And it's kind of cool to look through the passage of scripture where Jesus is and look at where those seven gifts pop up through his ministry. Interesting thing, uh, homework to do. Uh, basically, don't feel like you have to do everything in your spiritual gift. Don't feel like... Everything falls on you, and you've got to try to push because other people aren't necessarily coming up. There is a body God invented. Uh, God made the church to be a body that works together. And secondly, you don't have all the gifts, but please exercise whatever gifts you have in the church. So, uh, basically, I don't have much time to get into much other of this stuff, but basically, church affirmation. So if you're looking for what gifts you have and you're starting to think, I might have this gift, and you try to exercise it in the church, a couple things to do is um, look for personal inclination and church affirmation. So if you feel inclined toward this, you like doing it, you feel God's called you to it, you feel a soft spot in your heart for this event, for this type of people, for this ministry, that is a personal inclination, something where... God has put in you a desire to do something for his work, and you've got to find where that fits in your ministry. And then church affirmation is where you look around and you do something like preaching or teaching or some other act, and you get – and there's church people around you who will come in and go, you definitely have that gift. I see you're doing really good with that. Keep working on it. And if you don't get much church affirmation, either the – almost said extortioners again. The people who are supposed to be exhorting are either not doing their job and encouraging like they should, or you may not have that spiritual gift. So ask God, be very open and honest with God, and help let God help you to define which gifts you have. Um, let's turn to 1 John 2 real quick. 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17 there. There's a, a really good passion. First John 2, 15 through 17. <clears throat> Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If, the man if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of this world. Uh, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. How we can apply this to our lives in this area is the devil will try to use the world and your own flesh against you to keep you from doing these spiritual gifts. Many times we can't find our natural talents or our spiritual gifts because of entertainment. You find kids many times nowadays just spending all their time on TikTok or social media, social media and they don't get the time to find natural gifts that they may have. I know when we played a lot of video games before as a family, we did not find, I did not find that I loved to write, and I loved writing. Steven didn't find that he loved guitar. Benjamin didn't find that he loved piano, and Daniel with guitar, and all these gifts that began to pop out, Joshua with drawing, 
all these gifts begin to pop out when you limited it. So what we, what we can do is, on a separate note is make sure that we take this entertainment that the world is trying to produce in front of us and while it's not necessarily bad, make sure we limit it because everything too much is bad for you. I totally butchered that statement, but basically too much of anything is bad for you. Just like salt is bad for your body and too much, but we need salt to be able to live. So, uh, let's see here. Basically, we're supposed to do it all with love. So, 1 Corinthians 12, I don't really have time to get much into that, but at the end of our portion of scripture where we started on, I highlighted a part where it specifically talks about love. And you go into uh, 1 Corinthians 12, and it talks about the... Um, charity suffer long in his kind, but it talks about all these different things. He lists a bunch of the spiritual gifts, and they don't mean anything. They won't do anything for Christ's work if we don't have the love in there. We've got to make sure we have love. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Basically, go on a quest for your abilities. Try to find what abilities you have, natural or spiritually gifted abilities that God has and look for where you can put them in the church in order to help everything run smoother. Here's the quote I gave earlier. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. I learned that a quote during a sermon in Quest. Learned that quote. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. Basically that means that the two work together. When God is glorified, we are satisfied. And when you do both, that is where the harmony comes in, and that's where God wants us to be as Christians. Yep. Uh, finish here real quick with 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 11 to 12, to wrap up here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. I'm going to go ahead and read it here. Wherefore, also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness in the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's really where that quote comes from is this portion of scripture right here. So let's make sure we try to find in this next upcoming week, try to look at these seven, seven different spiritual gifts and the natural gifts maybe that you have that God wants you to use for him and his purposes. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for these truths. I pray that it uh, helps some.